Greetings, everyone. I wanted to um, do a follow up, follow the first of a follow up video of the last one that I did, where I explained my background in a Sabbath keeping cult called the Worldwide Church of God. That was the granddaughter cult of the Seventh day Adventist cult. And yes, I am using the word cult quite um, quite intently. But while I was never Seventh-day Adventist, after we left the Worldwide Church of God, my parents flirted with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, they received their magazine, I believe it was called Signs of the Times. This is in the late 70s after we had left the Worldwide Church of God. And my dad had a friend, a client, who was a uh, Seventh-day Adventist, who tried to get us in there. He showed, he and his wife came. They didn't come uninvitedly. They asked my father if they could come and, you know, show them some information about the church because they might be interested because we believed in the Sabbath at the time. But the church, the, the uh, offshoot group from the Worldwide Church of God that we were in was starting to fall apart. And we knew that it was just a matter of time with that. I was a teenager at the time. I was probably about 15 or so when we looked at the Seventh Day Adventist. Either 14 or 15. I remember the exact date. Uh, but I was in my mid-teens. Anyway. Yeah, when the guy came, uh, he showed us a film strip. And I do recall... You know, there was a lot of in there about Jesus. It started about Jesus and what he did on the cross. And, um, you know, we, we were trying to understand grace and what salvation was and what Jesus did for us. And it all sounded perfectly, perfectly legit. But then as the film strip progressed, it started to shift to the investigative judgment and then started talking intensely about Ellen G. White. And that's where they lost our family. And we never did join the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But the man gave us a subscription to the publication. And I remember I used to read that when it came in. And I remember the publication didn't really focus too much on Adventist doctrine. Um, just like the Church of God Seventh-day. We also had some exposure to the Church of God Seventh-day after we had left the Worldwide Church of God. And the Church of God Seventh Day was the daughter cult of the uh, Seventh Day Adventist Church. The Worldwide Church of God had more in common with the Church of God Seventh Day um, than with the Seventh Day Adventist Church. But I want to focus on the two, uh, on a couple, maybe three similarities with the Worldwide Church of God of yesteryear and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now the first obvious glaring um, similarity that everybody knows about is the Sabbath, Seventh-day Sabbath. Um, our, Herbert Armstrong, founder of the Worldwide Church of God, was already in the Church of God Seventh-day when he broke off to start his own cult. Um, Armstrong knew, he, he had a background in marketing, so um, he knew about product diversification. So he didn't go. Um, he didn't go at when he wanted his own cult. He didn't create another um, Church of God Seventh Day. But what he did do was take some foundations from the Church of God Seventh Day and ultimately the Seventh Day Adventist Church and built from there for a new, more distinct product, a more distinguished church, a church like no other at that time. Um, it was a church that emphasized the need to keep the uh, Old Testament Holy Days, their version of it. Um, they added that. Uh, they added a triple tithe. They added Anglo-Israelism. That's something I never really completely understood but it was their version of end times prophecy. 
anyway, and that was something that was always a little bit of a blur to me. I didn't, they, my parents really didn't talk that much about it. They talked about end times prophecy, but Anglo-Israelism is something, I don't think that made a huge impression on my folks, so they really didn't talk that much about it at home. Um, but the big similarity for us is the Sabbath, obviously. Now, the Sabbath in the Worldwide Church of God, at least from a child's perspective, I was eight when we entered there. I was 13 when we left. We still kept the Sabbath sort of for the next three years in the way that Dad didn't work on Saturdays. He had a part-time tax preparation business. He would work on Sundays instead. We went to services on Saturdays and sometimes got together with some of the people from there. But we, we, we did Sabbath light. Um during in the offshoot group it wasn't quite that intense we didn't worry worry about sundown on friday we didn't worry about turning off the television that that was all the sabbath it, during those three years was more of just the day we went to church and didn't go to work i, I had homework to do i did it but usually we were getting together with people anyway so it wasn't a big issue but in the worldwide church of god the sabbath uh, they didn't emphasize preparation day the way I see Adventists doing. But it was a concept. You did have to get stuff done before sundown on Friday. And there were times where the parents were really stressing out to get everything done by sunset. And then I would hear, Turn off the TV! It's sunset! Turn off the TV! It's 6.15! And I was scared to death to, uh, I really believed it. I really believed the whole nonsense because I remember I was afraid that if we turned on the TV, we were going to get struck by lightning. I mean, that's how scared we were. Not to, uh, that, that's how scared we were. I mean, what, what else can I say? Um, as a child, now, there were certain activities we could do. Now, when we first entered the Worldwide Church of God, my parents had joined the YMCA, and they thought um, going to the pool, they knew how much we all loved swimming. We had an above-ground pool in the backyard. We just loved it. In the summer, we lived in that pool, and even on the Sabbath. But um, Dad decided, let's do a family thing on Friday night. He'd take us to the YMCA. I don't know why he couldn't take us any other night, but I guess Friday night was the most convenient. Went to Family Swim, and I loved it. It was usually pretty busy in there. The minister found out that we were doing that, and they ordered us to stop, and we did, and we never did it again. I'm trying not to say something. Anyway, um, at first, the Sabbath was almost like a romance thing. My mother did make a nice Sabbath meal for the family on Friday night. And we even had a little bit of a Bible study. We do candlelight and it was and we do some prayers and you know we we ushered in the Sabbath very reverently. And you know, when you think about prayers and scripture and family time, that's a good thing. And if you want to do it on Friday night, there's not there's nothing forbidding us from doing it in scripture. It's when it becomes commanded. Now, we had just entered, so we didn't know a lot of people in the cult. That changed, so the schedule changed pretty quickly at that point. As we started, within a matter of weeks, like you're talking like six or eight weeks, we started getting into the routine of the Worldwide Church of God. What? the practice among the people was that when somebody that when because they met in rented facilities and people and they were regional and it wasn't uncommon for people to drive over an hour away they encouraged people to get together make it a day and people did it every single week and we took a, it didn't take very long for us to get into the uh, circle of things there get into the routine there um, every week there was a big Sabbath 
celebration meal for Saturday after services. People would come, people would meet at church, then they'd come over. Sometimes we, we've had, we had caravans of people following us to our house. And it was, it was pretty bizarre. But every single week there was like a holiday feast at our house. Usually my mother and father hosted it. They always had a lot of people over. Usually a sit down dinner around the dining room table, formal dining room table. It was a lot of work. Mom would be, at the time during those years, my mother most of those years did not work outside the home. There was a little while she did, but usually those only lasted for about a year. Um, but she would try to take Fridays off and get the Sabbath, all the Sabbath preparations done, dealt with. Every now and then we were invited to someone else's house. And I remember if people with kids my age came over, I always had fun. I always had fun. They were, the congregations were about 300 before they'd split them up. And I remember we'd go to the services, two hour services, no, okay, let's start at the beginning. We'd rush around Saturday morning, get up, get ready for church. It was not uncommon to drive an hour to get to church, get to services, and then they would stand around and talk for at least an hour. And then Sabbath meals at people's homes. Um, the meals, they were like holiday meals, but they were a lot of work and you had to do it every week. And it was it was really bizarre. The neighbors the neighbors would just look at all these cars in our driveway every single Saturday, and they'd like what? They'd be like, "What the hell is the Luciers into?" So that was kind of the routine for several years. I had fun sometimes if my parents would would um, invite people over who had kids my age because I was very very shy I didn't have a lot of friends so I was welcomed the thought of kids coming to the house as kids we couldn't turn on the television set we couldn't go to a store or anything here are the things you could not do on the Sabbath you could not go into a grocery store even to buy a bottle of milk I mean I guess if it was a life and death emergency they'd look the other way but um couldn't go into any store to do any transaction whatsoever, but if you decided to have your Sabbath meal at a restaurant, that was okay. You could pay someone to prepare you a meal and pay them for that, but you couldn't pay you couldn't pay a grocery clerk for a bottle of milk. Think about that. And there's a reason for that, and I'll probably get that to that in another video. So, any sort of stores, any sort of shopping was prohibited. Breaking the Sabbath was punishable by disfellowshipping. How they were going to find out, God only knows. Because it was all regional anyway. All the members lived far away from each other. It wasn't like you bumped into them in the store. It did happen once in a while, but very seldom. Anyway, after that... Um, what else, what else were we allowed to do? Um, we couldn't, um, as kids, now I'm talking from a child's perspective, when we had the other kids over, we were allowed for summertime to use the pool. I was told by other Armstrongists they, they were told not to. We did. We didn't ask if we could or not, we just did. Um, we used the pool. We were allowed maybe to take a walk to the park, maybe. That's, that was kind of iffy. Um, couldn't go to the movies. Couldn't do anything that required paying admission or going to some public place. You couldn't do it. Going to the beach, no. Out of the question. So, uh, but we could play board games. We could play cards. And the adults could drink. And drink. And drink. My mother probably possibly... It seemed my mother had her own spot, parking spot at the liquor store. Alcohol was a big part of the Worldwide Church of God. 
That's a difference with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So, and as a kid, I remember I'd, I'd always look at the newspaper to find out when sunset was on Friday and Saturday, and I would just be waiting for sunset so that I could turn the TV back on and breathe a sigh of relief. That was a typical Sabbath. I remember as a kid, um, during those years, the, the TV show All in the Family was the number one show, and we would watch it after the Sabbath, sometimes with the other Worldwide Church of God people, and I can, it's like seeing Archie and Edith at the piano about to sing Those Were the Days, and you hear the announcer from Television City in Hollywood. Boy, the way Glenn Miller played. Songs that made the hit parade. And then Archie would start singing, Boy, the way Glenn Miller played. That was, to me, the unofficial end of the Sabbath. The, the ceremonial but unofficial end to every Sabbath was hearing Archie and Edith sing Those Were the Days. And we just breathed a sigh of relief. The Sabbath was very burdensome. It was not a day of rest. It was a day of a lot of work. And then Sunday morning, basically, my parents slept off their Sabbath booze. I would get up early and watch Davy and Goliath. It was a parable. 
doesn't mean what it says. Jesus didn't mean it that way. It wasn't a parable. I will, I'll get it. I won't get into that, but it wasn't a parable. Jesus didn't use personal names in his parables. Okay, the next thing that sort of is very similar, but yet different than the Seventh-day Adventist Church. was um, dietary laws. <clears throat> now, what the Worldwide Church of God people didn't, or at least my parents didn't know, was that if they didn't follow the dietary laws exactly, who was going to find out? <laughs> who was going to find It's not like they had social media back then where people took pictures of all their food. But they, they were scared to death that if they ate a piece of pork... They would die. They were going to die. They were going to kill over, get sick, and be punished by God. So it was that they followed the dietary laws from Leviticus 11, similar to the way the Jewish people are, uh, the uh, traditional conservative Jewish uh, people are, are supposed to. But most Jewish people I know today don't practice that. They don't pay any attention to it. But, um, and that's no... No front to the Jewish people. I love the Jewish people. But just that most of the ones I know don't practice. Okay, it's just a fact of life. Um, so anyway, it was really bizarre the way we lived. We had to like, when we went out to eat, we had to be very careful about what we ordered. If we were invited to anybody's house for dinner, like the relative's house for Thanksgiving or something like that, uh, we had to tell them what we would not eat. And thankfully, they were usually pretty accommodating. They'd make sure that they weren't going to um, give us anything that we wouldn't eat. I miss, I miss the relatives so much. To think of all the... I mean, we did see them those years, but a lot of the relatives we didn't see. We were too busy with the church, and they were the world... They were worldly. I'm trying not to cry here. I missed out on so much those years. But, anyway, um, the way we had to live was so bizarre. We had to read, and, you know, with every can of something that you picked up in the grocery store, you had to study the ingredients. You had to read the ingredients of every single thing you bought that was prepared. It was so bizarre, but yet we found out that there was there, there was um, pork byproducts and so many things that are commonly consumed that you don't even think about. We didn't really keep the dietary laws. And another thing my father really didn't like doing. He was not a person. He was always dead set against ever asking directions. So in rest, same way in restaurants, he did not like grilling the wait staff about what was in certain things. Like as a kid, we used to go to Howard Johnson's and I used to like the spaghetti and meatballs. But Dad was not one to ask what was in. He was embarrassed to ask what was in things. So I, I want to just. We used to go to Burger Chef um, all the time, and back in those days, they used lard to fry their fries. Um, I just really do believe we did not keep them as well as we want. We thought we were keeping them. In fact, I know we weren't. A lot of meatball recipes have pork in them. But like I said, Dad was not one. If it wasn't written down that he could see, he didn't ask. So, anyway. It was frustrating. Um, it was really frustrating. And whenever you saw people in restaurants eating something unclean, you always kind of like, oh, Look at that. Oh, look at the worldly people eating that stuff. 
it was it was frustrating and I'm really surprised that people even people outside the church even had us over for whatever mostly relatives so that those are the three big big main things uh, you know with dietary laws they didn't uh, push vegetarians it wasn't that big a thing back in the 1970s but um, somebody wanted to be a vegetarian I don't think there was any rule in the church against it but it was it was a little it was a little aggravating to say the least um, I did not like the beef bacon my mother used to buy I know today people might buy turkey bacon in that cult or in similar situations that's their prerogative. I've tried turkey bacon. I don't like it. I love turkey and I love bacon, but turkey bacon tastes like bacon flavored turkey. So, um, that's all the, uh, that's all with the similarities. There might be some other similarities, but those are the three, like, main similarities between the Worldwide Church of God and the um, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, I know the Seventh-day Adventist Church, here's something that I was told uh, by someone who was like a fourth-generation Adventist who left, who's now gone, and she's on the Facebook pages. And, um, she told me that out of all the SCAs pra who practice, only about half of them are vegetarians. And of them, only about half of those are vegans. Now, out of the uh, half that eat meat, maybe only about half of them follow the Leviticus 11 dietary laws. So I like to tell these um, Adventists who will tell me what I can and can't eat, I'll point that out to them and say, you guys need to get your own act together. You guys need... You guys need to clean up your own house before you branch out and tell others what to do. And basically they'll say, oh, well, you're, that's, you're dodging the issue. That's not the point. You shouldn't be eating that. So, it was really frustrating. I really did follow all that stuff. I followed orders. If I didn't, God help me. That's all I can say. It was a pretty nightmarish scenario in that cult. And I've been told, even by some former Seventh-day Adventists, that I'm full of anger and hatred, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of wounds that haven't completely healed. But I am just trying to reach people who were like my parents on the fence. A hardcore Adventist, yes, some of them will change their minds, but they have to shift their mentality first before they're open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have to be willing. They have to start questioning things. Things start to have to be like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Wait a minute, this doesn't, this doesn't match up. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm seeing, some, I'm seeing a problem here. If they have to get to that point first. Some might respond to the gospel first. Uh, others might see the problems or the corruption or the inconsistencies first. That's what happened with my folks. I'm very grateful. As much as angry as I am of my of the six years of my childhood that, was, that I keep saying was flushed down the toilet... I am very grateful. I knew people who were in there in these movements for decades. And really, it was only about six years. And then you had the other three years. But the other three years in this, the offshoot group wasn't quite so bad. In fact, I have some fond memories of those years. Because we, we had a real bond with the people because there were other people who had left. And we had known them all. And I miss a lot of them. Surprisingly, there's one person who's that I remember from the, those years who's great. I found out her son goes to our church, the church we just started going to. Uh, this 
past year. So anyway, thank you for listening. I'm hoping that um, you folks can understand me a little better. That's the that's the reason for these videos for the Seventh Day Adventists, the Formers, and anyone else. Just understand where I'm coming from. So thank you for listening. Um, wish you all peace. Wish you all um, much joy. And Jesus is coming soon, and you need to go to Jesus. He said, "I come unto me." Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. This is the rest that he offers. Not a once a day, one day a week. I'm not opposed to resting or congregating on any particular day of the week. You want to do it Saturday, you go right ahead. But don't tell others it's the way of salvation. Don't tell others you don't love Jesus if you don't do it on that particular time slot. That is nonsense and you will answer for it if you don't turn around okay got on my soapbox here but thank you again for listening love you all peace out